Yesterday on Through the Bible, the Apostle Paul had a cool greeting for the church in Galatia, and today he's hot under the collar. Why don't you hop aboard the Bible bus with us and find out why as we continue our journey through God's entire word. Now, I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, and while you find your place in Galatians chapter 1, verse 2, let's take a minute to catch up with Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, and he's here to fill us in on our travels with the World Prayer Team this week. Greg, where are we? Well, this week, Steve, we're going to be traveling uh, through Russia. Oh, that's got a special place. In I know my it heart. does. You have some, uh, yes. some ethnic heritage. Yes, in unless that you are a, a Native American, we all come from somewhere, and I come from <laughs> Russia and the Ukraine. So, anytime I hear about this part of the world, it always warms my heart. And that's why we make sure to talk about it because we like to have your heart warmed, Steve. You know, that's that's a good thing for <laughs> Thank all of you, us. Thank you, Greg. Um, and just a real quick summary: we do have a wonderful uh, translation and adaptation of Doctor McGee done by. Vlad Vladimir Sorokin. Right, and uh, he's been doing it since 1976. That's right. When we first went into the Russian language. And when you think about all the vicissitudes of the government and the restrictions and then uh, opening up and all the changes over the decades, God has allowed us to faithfully bring the gospel to the people of Russia. And I would just say parenthetically, we have a second Russian translation called Central Asian Russian, also known as CARS. That's an easy way to remember it. And it's actually a Central Asian Russian version of the scriptures, and we use terms that are more familiar to people from a Muslim background, and so yeah. that's more for Central Asia. But yeah. enough background. Yes, let's get to the. Good I know stuff. how you love to get to the letters, so let's yeah. get to them. Here's the first one. This is from Alexei in Moscow, who writes, "I listen to your programs in the morning, and it is amazing how understandable the Bible becomes when someone who knows and loves it cares to explain it to us." Being very new to the Christian faith, it is a tremendous help in my spiritual journey. That's such a great uh, letter, Stephen. We love it when people say things about the Bible bus in another language that we want to hear in English, and that's a great example of that. Here's another great letter from Mikhail, and he lives in St. Petersburg. Although I'm not a believer yet, oh, we love these letters, don't we? I listen to your programs on the Internet. I'm fascinated by the Bible. Your broadcasts are very interesting, very informative, and at times eye-opening. I'm learning a lot and thinking a lot. Sometimes I feel I need to commit my life to God, and sometimes I think my fascination with the Bible goes too far. I don't have any friends, relatives, or acquaintances who share my interest. It is because of the radio that I feel I am not alone. But now I know there are millions of people who take God seriously. Please pray for me. I feel alone. And thank you for being a true, albeit virtual, friend for me. Hmm. Just a great, great letter. Very encouraging. And here's one um, dealing with someone who's had tremendous loss. This is from a listener actually in St. Petersburg. Recently, I lost my husband, who was 51 years old. He was a doctor, cardiologist, and saved many lives in the course of his practice. We loved each other. We were busy, leading a full life, and then suddenly he was gone. I was shocked and dismayed, and his death made me think about the meaning of life. I began seeking deeper spiritual answers to our existence. It is then that I discovered through the Bible broadcasts. I became an avid listener, and the Bible studies with Dr. McGee became my daily bread. This journey into the world of the Bible saved me and helped me refocus. Jesus has become a part of my life, and it changes my entire perspective. And Steve, as we read these letters and as I heard you read them, the the thought that came to me is how amazing it is that we get to hold out the word of life decade after decade, day after day, thanks to the faithful prayers and the financial support of our listeners. People are making it possible for anyone, whether it's someone who doesn't know the Lord or someone who just lost her husband. Isn't that an amazing picture that we're able to be there with the word of God for people? Absolutely. And you can join our world prayer team and be a part of reading stories like this and praying for these specific people and others along the way just go to ttb.org forward slash pray and greg why don't you pray for us as we open our study father we're overwhelmed with the privilege of giving out your whole word to the whole world thank you that we can be there when people want to meet you they want to know you they want to learn about you and now we want to know you and learn more about you so we ask you to open our hearts and minds as we study your word in jesus name amen now here's through the bible with dr j vernon mcgee 
Now today, as we return back to the epistle to the Galatians, we are in this section which we have identified as the introduction. And in the first five verses, it's a very cool greeting by the apostle Paul to this church that was listening to legalism. And then he's going to give them a pretty warm declamation, verses 6 through 10, and make it very clear what the gospel is, by the way. And there's no reason for anyone today getting fouled up as to what the gospel really is if you study the epistle to the Galatians. Now will you note as we come back to this second verse today of the first chapter. Now Paul has told us what kind of an apostle he is. He's not an apostle that was made one by an appointment or commission of man. That is, he didn't go to school and learn to be an apostle. And he didn't become an apostle by a ritualistic method. The first was legalistic. But the ritualistic, that is, through laying on of the hands of some church official or a group, he is an apostle that is different from that. I am an ordained minister today. Ordained minister from man and through man. They told me I had to go to school. I had to have certain degrees. I had to finish a seminary before I could be ordained. I did that. And that was the from man. That was the legalistic side. And then I went before a church body. They examined me. And then they decided they would make me an ordained minister. And I knelt in the church I was ordained in and had been called as pastor in a second Presbyterian church in Nashville, Tennessee. And they put their hands on me. A group of men did. And they said, you're an ordained minister. Now, I'm that kind of a minister. Now, Paul said, I'm not that kind of an apostle. He said, man didn't have anything to do with it. I'm an apostle made one directly by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now he says, and all the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia. Now, the second thing for us to note here is the fact that it's churches. And you notice it's rather cool greeting. It's very brief. It's very formal, very terse. No one here is mentioned by name personally. And Paul doesn't express anything here other than he says to all the brethren. And it's not to just one church, but plural churches. Now, there are two ways in which the word church is used in the New Testament. One is it includes the entire body of believers of all different groups, that is, those that have trusted Christ, and they belong to that body. Then there is another way the word church is used, and that is of a local assembly. And that's what he's referring to here. There were churches in different places in Galatia. There was one in Antioch of Pisidia. There was one in these other places that Paul had visited, Derby and Lystra. And he's writing to all the churches. Some of them, I'm sure we do not even have the name at all. The local church, therefore, is in view and not the corporate body of believers. And when we get to Ephesians, we'll look at the church as that corporate body of believers, invisible. But you see, the invisible body is to make itself visible today in a corporate body. And I do believe that you should be identified with a local body of believers. That, I think, is important. Now, Paul uses his usual greeting that he has, it's rather formal, in verse 3, "...grace be to you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ." Now, the word grace here, we've seen before, charis, was actually the Gentile manner of greeting in that day. And the word peace was shalom, and that was the religious way in Jerusalem of greeting anyone, shalom. Now, the grace of God must be experienced before we can experience the peace that's from God the Father. And that, I think, is very important for us to see. I'll dwell on this a little bit further when we get to Philippians. 
I have dwelt on it before, but we'll be back to it. So I pass over verse 3 with those brief comments, and I come on down now to verse 4. "...who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father." Now, here is another one of those marvelous verses that when you come to it, I really don't know what to say. I can't rise to the level of this verse. So let me say some things about it that I trust might carry you to the height. Now, Paul here mentions now the Lord Jesus Christ back there in verse 3. And having mentioned him, he says now, "...who gave himself for our sins." And here Paul gives the germ of the subject. And what is it? He gave himself. Now, nothing that you and I can add to the value of his sacrifice. Nothing. He gave himself. What do you have to give, friends? Anything? Can you add anything to the fact he gave himself? That's all that's necessary. He gave himself. And how wonderful and glorious that is. I just don't know what to say. I'm speechless when I read a thing like this. He gave himself. And when you give yourself, you've given everything. You've given who you are, what you've got. Your time, you've given talent, you've given it all. He gave himself. He couldn't give any more. And you and I can't add to that. I haven't anything to add to that. He gave himself for our sin. Paul just couldn't wait to say it. And so, having mentioned the Lord Jesus Christ, and he calls him our Lord Jesus Christ, he's my Savior. Can you say today he's your Savior? And then can you say... The Lord is my shepherd. It's one thing to say he's a shepherd. It's another thing to make it possessive. The Lord is my shepherd. Can you say that today? Because he goes on to say here that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Now, do you notice something there that's very important? He delivers us from this present evil evil world. There is, therefore, a present value of the gospel which proves its power and genuineness. Now, the gospel today can deliver you from this present evil world. Now, this poor girl, she tried to live by the law. Some cult put her on the law. What did she turn up with? Why, she turned up with a baby. She knows who the father is, but She's not married to him. How tragic it is. May I say that the gospel today can deliver us from this present evil world. Now, over against this letter, I have literally now thousands of letters from folk who've turned to Christ, and he's delivered them. He's delivered them from drugs. He's delivered them from alcohol. He's delivered them from sex sins, such as this. He's delivered them. And only Christ, my friend, can deliver you in a case like that. He alone can do it. That proves the genuineness of the gospel. He gave himself, and he gave himself for our sin. And that means he had to take my place. He died in my room, raised again. And he did it that he might deliver us from this present evil world. And now, that doesn't exhaust this verse. That's according to to the will of God. Now, he can deliver us, and it'll not be according to law, but it must be according to the will of God, my friend. The will of God is that when he saves you, that you're not to live in sin. How wonderful that is. He can deliver us, wants to deliver us. He will deliver us, and he'll do it according to the will of God. It's his will that you be delivered. My friend, this is a verse that makes you feel like throwing your hat in the air, does it not? But now let's move on. We read here, "...to whom be glory forever and ever." Amen. This is just a moment. Paul stops to render praise to God. I have become convinced today 
that I have never emphasized in my ministry as I should, the fact we should praise God more than we do. Let's just come right down to the nitty-gritty today, right down where the rubber meets the road. Did you this morning praise his name when you got up? You thank him for a new day? You say, oh, it was raining, it was a storm, it was cold or hot or whatever it was. It was a terrible day. But did you thank him for it? Praise his name that he brought you to a new day? I had to have a bout with cancer before I came to the place where I now, every day, the first thing I do of a morning... I don't care whether the sun comes up or whether it's pouring down rain. I say, Lord, thank you for bringing me to a new day. How wonderful it is. How wonderful it is. We need to praise him more. I want to praise him. I want you to know that I want glory to go to the name of my God and my Savior. I don't want to stand on the sidelines and compromise today with all of these plays and songs that are belittling the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm speaking out. I say to you, He is God manifest in the flesh. He gave Himself for me. I want to praise His name. To whom be glory forever and ever. And that forever begins right now, and it's going right on into eternity. Now, that concludes this first part. And I think you'll have to admit, won't you, friends, that this is a pretty rugged sort of a salutation, a very cool greeting. Now he's going to state the subject. The subject is stated now. And now he goes from cold to hot, and I mean he's hot now. Hot under the collar, if you please. Why? Because the fact is that there are those that are mutilating the gospel, Paul I tell you, would give his life for the gospel. Listen to him now. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. In other words, the Judaizers had come in. And the thing that we need to note here, and I'd like to call attention to it, is this, that the gospel has two aspects to it. And it can be used, actually, in two senses. There are the facts of the gospel, that Jesus died, that he was buried, that he was raised bodily from the dead. Paul said to the Corinthians, you'll recall, in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you the gospel. He said, I received it. He didn't think it up. He received it. What was it? Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, friends, those are the historical facts of the gospel, and they can't be changed. And you've never preached the gospel unless you've stated those facts. Now, the second thing is the interpretation of the facts. They're to be received by faith plus nothing. Now, Paul will get to that, and I'll wait till he gets to it. But the thing that he's saying here is this. The Judaizers had come into the Galatian country, and the facts of the gospel were not challenged. They were historical facts. They were living at this time. Paul said 500 who saw him at one time. And when you've got that many people around as witnesses, you don't run around denying the facts of the gospel. But it was the interpretation of the fact. What they were saying was this. They did it very subtly, very slyly, They said, did Brother Paul come here among you? Why, they said, yes. He came and preached the gospel, and we accepted it. We were converted, and we know Christ now as our Savior, and we're in the body of believers. They knew all of that. Now, these Judaizers, this is how they moved. Oh, they said, that's wonderful. You know, Brother Paul is quite accurate in as far as he goes. But he doesn't go far enough. Did he tell you that you should keep the law? Oh, he didn't? Well, then, he should have told you that, yes, you're to trust Christ, but you must also follow the law. You won't be saved. May I say to you, does that sound like anything that's up to date today? 
Well, it's not up to date. It's one of the oldest heresies that we have. It was in Paul's day. Adding something to the gospel of grace that you have to do instead of believe. Or say you believe plus doing something. And I have statements of several cults and isms, and I know two of them have this. Four things you must do to be saved. Too bad Paul didn't know that when he said to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It's too bad that Simon Peter didn't know that when he said, There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's too bad the apostles didn't know that. And it's too bad Jesus hadn't told them that. And he had told them, You go and preach this gospel and it was that you are to do nothing but to trust what has been done for you. That's very important to see here. In fact, it's all important. The gospel shuts out all works, everything. Now, what he's saying here is this, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that call you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Then he says, well, there's only one gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And that word pervert is metastrapho. It's a strong word. It was used by Dr. Luke when he was recording Simon Peter's sermon in Acts 2.20, when the sun was turned to darkness. That word turn. James uses the same word, laughter turned to mourning. In other words, this is quite a revolution. To attempt to change the gospel has the effect of making it the very opposite of what it really is. That's very important to see, by the way. Now he goes on here, verse 8. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now this is a strong as anything could possibly be. He says, if an angel declared any other message than the gospel, he would be dismissed with a strong invective. Suppose right now, while I'm making this tape and while you are listening to it, suppose that an angel appears here to me and would say to me, look, McGee, you should add something to that. And when you hear it, the angel would appear to you and say, look, You should add something to it. McGee is right as far as he goes, but you've got to do something else. May I say to you, you could say to that angel, and I could say to him, get out of here. I'm not listening to you, though you be an angel from heaven. Paul said that an angel from heaven, and believe me, these cults don't look like angels to me. These that are preaching actually another gospel today, they look like anything but angels. But however... Satan makes his ministers angels of light, and some of them are attractive, are they not? Now, he says, if any preach any other gospel unto you than that which you've received, let him be accursed. Now, friends, that's strong language. In fact, that's so strong, I hesitate to use it on the radio, but I'm going to give it to you. He says, if any preach any other gospel unto you than that which you've received, let him be damned. And friends, I can't make that any stronger than that. And this is a day when they're using language like that, and I frankly don't like to use it. But Paul used it. That's the word he's using here. Now he goes on to say, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now you preach the message that we're giving here today and will give in this, you'll be in trouble. And I'm going to have to wait till next time to explain to you what I mean you'll be in trouble. Because it's the gospel of the grace of God today that the sinner hates. And a lot of unsaved church members don't like to hear it today. They want to do something. They want something that appeals to the flesh. And I tell you, the one thing the gospel does, it puts you and me in the dust and makes us beggars. And we have to come and ask God. We have to turn to him and receive from him everything, and we bring nothing in order to be saved. Oh, this is a glorious gospel, but we'll have to wait till next time to continue. 
What a glorious gospel we have. In a world where most news is really bad news, we've got the best news that anyone can receive. The gospel not only rescues us from the depravity and destruction that's caused by our own sin, but it also guarantees us an everlasting life in Christ Jesus. If you'd like to know more about the message of the gospel, then you need to visit ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? There you'll find a bunch of different free resources, including Dr. McGee's e-booklet called Faith Plus Nothing Equals Salvation. That's the equation that Dr. McGee talked about today, by the way. Call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, and we'll put a few of these resources in the mail to you. Now, we're just getting started in this great letter to the Galatians, so I hope that you'll meet me here tomorrow. And, as always, invite your friends to join us as the Bible bus heads out for another great adventure in God's Word. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole Word to the whole world.